Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, From Cancer Survivorship to Diaper Changes, Creating a Family at Cancer. My name is Monica Bryant and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Triage Cancer. And before we get into the heart of the topic today, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items. All callers will be muted for the duration of the webinar. And if you have any questions for the speakers or technical problems, please type them into the chat box to the side of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website, triagecancer.org. At the end of the webinar, you'll be redirected to a survey, and please take a few moments to fill this out and let us know what you think. Our wonderful speakers of the day have agreed to take questions as we go along, so please don't feel like you have to wait till the end of the webinar to ask your questions if they come up. Just a bit about Triage Cancer, we are a national nonprofit organization that provides education and resources on the entire continuum of cancer survivorship issues to survivors, caregivers, advocates, and healthcare professionals. And we do this in several different ways. We host a speakers bureau of experts and survivors available to anybody hosting an educational event. We also host an educational blog, provide online resources, and participate in seminars, webinars, and conferences all over the country. Some of our upcoming webinars um, include Decoding Medical Bills in partnership with the SAM Fund. And then we have two other great speakers who are going to be talking about nutrition and then also dealing with end-of-life care. So all, more information about all of our webinars can be found on our website. And if you've missed any of our past webinars, don't worry because the recordings are available for free on our website. And then new for 2016 are the Triage Cancer Conferences. These are one-day events that are completely free, open to patients, caregivers, survivors, and healthcare professionals. We're also offering free CEUs to nurses and social workers who attend. And today we'll be focused on the practical and legal issues around survivorship care plans, health insurance options, navigation, employment issues, and finances. So we have three coming up this year, and, and here are the cities. And for more information or to register, again, visit triagecancer.org. So with that, I am absolutely delighted to introduce our two amazing speakers for the day, Alice Creasy and Samantha Watson. Alice is a cancer champ turned activist and mother of a toddler who was conceived in 2008 with donor sperm and born in 2013. When not lobbying for insurance reform, Alice educates patients, providers, and billing managers on oncofertility options and insurance access. Samantha Watson is a two-time cancer survivor and the mom of two young kids. She lives in the Boston area and runs the SAM Fund, a nonprofit dedicated to helping young adults manage the overwhelming costs of cancer. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alice. Thank you so much, Monica. I'm very excited to participate in this webinar. It's my second one with Triage Cancer, and I'm learning to speak slower on recorded lines. So I would like for the audience to ping me if I start speaking too fast, because those who are going to listen to this recording afterward <laughs> need to be able to understand what I'm saying. I'm excited to also see all the different people from various parts of the U.S. joining us today. It's very exciting that we can um, hopefully impart some inspiration and a clear path to parenthood for everyone on on, um, on this call today. I, we have you know, set some dedications and intentions that once we tell our stories, uh, we want to make sure that everyone feels very open, that they're part of the conversation today. Now, I, I did start out as a patient, just like so many people who are listening in, in 2008 was diagnosed with breast cancer and learned very early on that my fertility was going to be threatened by my treatment. I, at that time, knew I wanted to be a parent. I did not know when. I knew that I wanted all options available to me. I didn't want cancer or my cancer treatment or uh, uh, health care that I thought was failing me by not covering my fertility preservation to limit my options in any way. Adoption was always on the table for me, but I wanted biological children to also be on the table for me. So I very quickly uh, was able to preserve my fertility. Now things got really complicated really fast because I did have a partner at the time and I spoke with a fertility specialist at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday 
And because I, of where I was in my cycle at the time with respect to my period, she said I had to start my hormone injections the next day. So 5 p.m. on a Tuesday, and I needed to be in her office at 7.30 a.m. on a Wednesday. She also informed me because at the time, fertility preservation's egg freezing technology was not as good in 2008 as it is today that I probably would need a sperm source so I could freeze embryos in addition to eggs. Well, okay, I have my boyfriend sitting here. Therefore, I marched right into the office where he was working at the time in my home, and I said, we need to freeze embryos, and I need to start tomorrow. And he looked at me and he said, we won't be doing that. Just like that. And I said, what do you mean we're not going to be doing that? And he said, we don't have a future together. Usually when I tell that story and the room can gasp, they do. And, you know, people empathize with, oh, my gosh, that was probably pretty bad timing on his part. But in reality, it was good timing. It was the last devastating piece of information I had in a series of devastating conversations and being diagnosed with cancer. What that did, though, is it freed me. It freed me to walk into the fertility clinic's office the very next day and be handed, quite literally, a catalog of sperm donors, a catalog of of anonymous sperm donors. I never thought in a million years I'd be sitting there at 31 years old basically looking at statistics of some of the apparently best picks out there for DNA and felt like I was recruiting a basketball team. But nonetheless, that's the journey that I embarked on. So my son truly was conceived in 2008. He was frozen as a day two embryo. And then after I uh, became what I like to call cancer champ, uh, I went, I I decided around my five-year mark in my survivorship that it was time to become a mom. So I made the choice to be a single mom. I did a frozen embryo transfer, and so he he sat in a tank for five years as a day two embryo. I also did PGS testing on him to make sure he was it was a chromosomally normal embryo. I just thought my body had been through so much I wanted to limit the possibility of a miscarriage, and I gave birth to him October 11th in 2013. And he is now a hilarious, just absolutely hilarious toddler, like all toddlers are. And we we just have an amazing life together. Um, so that's my story and my journey. And I want you to know that nothing is off the table. Whatever questions anyone has about what it's like to be the mom of a donor-conceived child, about what it's like to do a frozen embryo transfer, what it's like to be a single mama, you know, how I'm navigating conversations with him, you know, about being a cancer survivor, nothing's off the table. Um, But before I get into further parts of the presentation today, I want to introduce my fabulous and amazing friend, Sam Watson, who does run the Sam Fund. And if you don't know who she is, you need to get to know Sam really quickly. She has an amazing organization, and I'm so honored to be doing this webinar with her today. Thanks, Alice. Well, that was quite an intro. And also from looking at these pictures, I might be in love with your son. I hope that's not weird. (laughs) So, hey, everybody, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time with us. And, Monica, thank you again for inviting me to be part of today's webinar. This is sort of outside the scope of what I typically do at the SAM Fund, which I can tell you guys a little bit about if you're interested. Um, but it's so intensely personal to me for so many reasons, both because I'm a mom of two young kids, um, because I'm a cancer survivor, and because I'm in this field and in this community every single day and have sort of a bird's eye view, but also a very close on the ground look of some of the challenges that still exist in the whole arena of fertility preservation and family building and how all of this sort of comes together. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story and we'll we'll go from there. So when Alice said that back when she was diagnosed and talking about fertility preservation, the processes weren't as good as they are now. Um, I preceded her by about 10 years, and so we're talking about the dark ages. And (laughs) I was diagnosed in 99, and I had bone cancer. I was 21. I was single. I was a senior in college. I was newly legal to drink. That's what was on my radar screen. I was not thinking about illness or family or futures or anything like that. Um, I was thinking about graduating from college. And so I was diagnosed with bone cancer and thrown into the cancer world so quickly that, 
you know, everything was spinning. And the one conversation that I remember having, and I talked to my mom about this recently because I wanted to make sure as we start these conversations that I'm not misremembering anything at that time, but the one conversation I remember happen, having um, with my oncologist at the time went something like this. I said, well, do you think that I should freeze my eggs? which is hilarious to me now that I even thought to ask that question because I'm not even sure I knew at the time what that would entail or what I was Mm. even asking. Um, But I asked it, and he looked me in the face, and he said, listen, it's experimental, it might not work, and you don't have time. And I was writing about this recently, actually, on our Samfon blog, and I don't have any regrets about how that conversation went. It was, you know, 17 years ago, He's right, it was experimental, and it might not have worked. But even regardless of that, when a doctor looks at you and says, you know what, you might not have time to think through anything but starting chemo right now, you do what you have to do. And I can't look back with regret. I think the thing that I wish, I wish I had felt more empowered in my decision making at that time, but hindsight is 2020, right? And so we had that brief conversation. I started chemo within a couple days, went through about a year of treatment. And I came back to Boston. I live in the Boston area. I was going to school at the time up here. And I came back to Boston, and about six months later, really was just having a lot of symptoms, couldn't figure out why I didn't feel right, my counts weren't recovering, I was tired, and so on and so forth. And I was diagnosed in April of 2001 with secondary myelodysplastic syndrome, which is basically an early form of leukemia. And that time, I was not thinking about anything family building related. I didn't even ask the question because I wasn't even sure I was going to survive it. I was actually pretty sure that my statistics were very, very low. So I focused on treatment and I didn't ask the questions. At that time, I was 23, still single, still not thinking about, you know, preserving choices or options or anything down the road. And I went through my treatment and was very, very fortunate. I had a bone marrow transplant 15 years ago. And there's a whole lot more I could say about all of that, obviously. But from the sort of family building, fertility preservation perspective, there's not a whole lot more to tell from that time. Um, And I spent a lot of years immediately after that still not really thinking about it, kind of dancing around it a little bit in my head, like, is this something I should think about? Is this something I should talk about? But what I didn't know until recently, and I should have known this part earlier. I was actually shocked when I learned it recently. What I what I didn't know is that there was there might have been a window of time after my treatment when my fertility might have been intact and I could have talked about preservation. But that wasn't on my radar screen. What I was thinking about, you know, at that time and this is 2002, 2003 was, well, am I going to start a family? <laughs> Do I even want to think about this? Do I want to find out? And my thought process really was I'm not ready to do anything about it. So whatever the answers tell me, it's irrelevant right now. And so I let it be. And so to fast forward a few years, I would go through my follow-up and meet with my doctors and stuff. And each time, and this is sort of my own personal, you know, area where I have a very strong opinion about language and conversations. We'll talk more about that. But as I talked to my doctors, the conversation always led to, well, you're probably not going to be able to have kids or you can't do this or you won't be able to do that. And it took me a really long time to realize that they were talking about one option that probably was impacted because of my chemo. But what they should have said to me and what I want to start out by saying to everyone on this webinar is that if you want to be a parent, you can be a parent. And that's a much different conversation because then it then it involves exploring the options that are open to you, not necessarily focusing on the ones that aren't. And so I met my husband. We started talking about starting a family met with IVF specialists, met with my doctors, met with adoption agencies, put all the options out on the table in front of us, and landed at adoption. And we adopted my son in February of 2010 and my daughter in August of 2013, both domestically. And so as we go forward in this presentation, we really want to talk about the decision-making process and the questions that would be helpful. And it's not about which process is right or best or cheapest or quickest or any of that. It's just about feeling more empowered as you go forward in figuring out how you want to start your family and how you can empower yourself to make the best decisions that you can. And, you know, on the surface, I think Alice and my stories look very different from one another. But as we've been talking in advance of this webinar, we realized there are so many similarities and there are so many parallels. And just because we came about this, for, you know, via different paths, 
we've gone through so many of the same experiences and as parents still deal with so much of the same stuff. So let's, uh, let's get on with it, shall we? Yes. And I, one of the things, Sam, too, that, that I, you know, love in kind of the context of this and what we always talk about with, with parenthood is we want everybody to experience the things that, that you, we have to laugh about as moms, the dirty diapers, you know, the midnight wake up calls, you know, wake up sessions, the, you know, the throw up down the front of your dress right before you're trying to get to the office, you know, the, all the things that are the, the happy chaos that we're experiencing right now. We want, if that's what, what a survivor wants or a cancer champ, as I like to call everybody, then that's what we want for you. So today really is about laying out those options and, and, potentially raising consciousness by giving you some questions to be thinking about so that you go to an introspective place and and consider the important things for you as you're choosing the path to go down. Now, you know, we it's it's funny because you mentioned the dark ages too, Sam. I mean, I, I'm a little bit the dark ages too because 2008 to 2016, <laughs> yep. the difference in the technology, you know, so egg freezing as a fertility preservation option was very experimental in, in 08 too. The next year, vitrification, which is a fast freezing of eggs, started to kind of explode across the country. And then in 2000, um, 2012, I think it was 2012, uh, ASRM, the, the, the regulatory body that oversees assisted reproductive medicine, released the, the experimental label from egg freezing. So now, you know, cancer patients do have more options. Men can bank sperm. Men can do uh, uh, surgical removal of sperm if they're unable to produce a sample. Women can freeze eggs. They can freeze embryos. Women can freeze ovaries whole ovaries, women can freeze ovarian tissue. Freezing ovaries and ovarian tissue is considered experimental by ASRM. It's um, the physicians who do it routinely don't feel like it's experimental because they've already had babies born from putting a whole ovary back in, into their body or by putting ovarian tissue back into their body. So assisted reproduction itself is very exciting in the sense that we have more options today than survivors ever had before. And some of these options are still available to people even after they went through their cancer treatment. Not all are. You know, I want to touch a little bit on the impact of cancer treatment. And uh, and before I do, I want to find out: is there are there any uh, questions or anyone on this call who might still be a candidate for fertility preservation on this specific call that you might have a question right now before we we move on to kind of the impact of treatment? Okay, good. Okay. Because we kind of, Sam, you and I touched on this so much about what we're going to talk about, so I want to kind of jump right into what could happen. Is that cool with you? Go for it. All right. So in some cases, pregnancy is simply delayed, where there might not be any permanent gonadal damage, but you have to go through treatment for such a long time that depending on the age you were when you were diagnosed, you might age out of your fertile window. And that's significant. So what I say is all cancer champs really are at risk for a complicated path to parenthood simply because the cancer treatment might be limiting of your options, and that's why we're advocating so much that the physicians should have the front-end conversation very early so that you have all your options in front of you. The, the second level of you know, shortening of window or the, the damage that could be done is when you have hormonal depletion, and this is the same for men as it is for women. If you are depleted of estrogen, if you're depleted of progesterone, whether it's medically or because you had gonadal damage occur, there's, there are other impacts to your health that have to be considered. Osteoporosis, low libido, if men don't have testosterone, it's the same thing. I had a gentleman sitting in front of me who was a med student, and he had gone through cancer treatment, and he used to be this person that his, his identity of his, himself was one that was really a go-getter, very ambitious. And he said to his post-cancer self, he just thought that he was lazy. He literally assigned the term, I'm just lazy now. He thought that that's what cancer did to him. It just his personality changed from being ambitious to lazy. He had never considered depression, and he certainly never thought of testosterone depletion. And he finally had someone say to him, maybe you just have low testosterone. And so he finally got it checked, 
and that's exactly what the problem was. Once they re-regulated his hormones, he felt completely like himself again and back to normal and, you know, was out there ambitious. These things are so important that we're talking to physicians regularly about it. You know, we're so lucky now that so many doctors, reproductive specialists, urologists, and IVF physicians have taken it upon themselves to become oncofertility experts, you know, true specialists who have enough knowledge of our cancer treatment and our cancer path that they can, they can do a full evaluation of, of what a patient, you know, might need to be considering through their whole life and not just with respect to parenthood, but to the, with respect to the rest of our life too. Then the, the most severe, you know, damage that could happen is the follicular depletion, the infertility and sterility. So I was telling Sam just another um, another story where a gentleman that I'm very close to sent me a text message and said, my testicles shrunk. You know, that's not a text message you're, you're thinking that you're ever going to get. <laughs> and, you know, I felt so bad for him, but thankfully, I felt thankful that he had me to ask because his, his none of his di- doctors told him that that could be a side effect of going through his second bone marrow transplant. And the reason that happens is because the – if the cancer treatment targets the stem cells that are responsible for volume, volume of fluid, volume of semen, and you don't have that fluid anymore, then naturally the body cavity that the fluid is housed in is going to shrink. And that's, you know, that, that's very straightforward, but nobody warned him. And I, you know, I felt so terrible for him because, you know, this is something that, that was a very serious issue for him and his identity as a man and his masculinity. And once he learned really what it was, then he could kind of, he could deal with it. Um, You know, but these are things that we're trying to encourage physicians to talk more about on the front end. You could be subfertile and you could see a recovery in in fertility. For women, we could see it for a window, but since since our fertility declined so significantly uh, in our mid to late 30s anyway, you know, if a woman is subfertile, um, you know, during that time period already from cancer treatment and she doesn't have a partner, isn't pursuing active parenthood and, and does have an attachment to biological parenthood, that could be a good window still for fertility preservation where she has some recovery of her fertility, um, but she hasn't quite aged out because we might hit menopause faster than our peers. Premature ovarian, ovarian failure or asospermia. Asospermia means there's an absence of sperm in the, in the ejaculate. What we know now about asospermia is that there might not be an absence of sperm in the testicles completely. We just don't see it in in the ejaculate. So there are are great assisted reproductive surgeries and procedures to help find um, sperm in those testicles through an aspiration or a biopsy, which opens up the, the future for survivors. In many instances where, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, we would have just written them off as being sterile. When you have complete follicular depletion, though, there's some other considerations for your health. And the reason I bring these up is because they're also considerations for the path to parenthood that you choose. So cardiovascular health can be damaged by, you know, complete follicular depletion. If you are 22 and you enter menopause at that age, these are the things that need to be monitored. I was put into medical menopause for three straight years. I was supposed to stay in medical menopause for five, and I begged my doctor to let me come out of it because I... I, I had such a difficult time with it myself, and I have such empathy for those who um, who are put into you know medical menopause either through surgical means or through medications at you know 19, 20, 21 years old. It just it's very tough on our mental health. It's tough on our cardiovascular health. You know, for men, erectile dysfunction, and for all of us, fatigue is a big one. So, you know, all, there's such a range of, of what people could be facing. And one, when Sam and I were talking, you know, we, one of the important things that we both agree with so much is we, we, we don't like to hear providers or our peers, our cancer champ peers, treating adoption like it's the last resort option. And, there, you know, so many providers do that maybe because, or not even just providers, I, I don't want to put on providers, but so many, so many people in society do that because of their own attachment to a biological family. But many survivors, many cancer patients already want to adopt from the beginning, and then they hear the story of how difficult it is to adopt. So today is about what you can do and not about what you can't do. Sam, do you want to address some of the questions that we think it's important for people to reflect on? 
Absolutely. You set me up perfectly, so thanks. <laughs> so, like Alice was mentioning, you know, when I was finished with treatment and starting to just think about this stuff, it started to become very clear to me. And I think the same sometimes, unfortunately, is still true now, but especially 10, 15 years ago at workshops or conferences or any place where there was a facilitated conversation about family building after a cancer diagnosis, things seemed to look very much the same in terms of the trajectory that we were supposed to follow. And it went something like this. You know, find out if if you're fertile after cancer, and if not, you can try IVF, IUI. If those don't work, you can look to donor eggs or donor sperm or maybe a donor embryo. If those don't work, you can look to a gestational carrier. And if that doesn't work, you can always adopt. And there's a lot of things wrong with something like that. And it's not just my sort of adoption personal story coming into play here because one qualifier that I should put on the whole rest of the presentation is that the choice is yours to make. You know, adoption's not for everyone. Single parenthood's not for everyone. IVF's not for everyone. So Alice and I are not coming from that place at all, but we need to turn the table a little bit and feel like as patients, we're back in control of the decisions that we're making and that there's not this certain trajectory that we need to follow because the next step of that is that each option down the line is a little bit worse than the one before it, is a little bit less than the one before it, and that's not fair to anybody. It's not fair to the patient, it's not fair to the family, it's not fair to the kids. Um, no one's family should feel less than, and no pa no patient should feel so disempowered that the choice isn't theirs to make. And so we wanted to really take a minute and encourage all of you listening to think about what's important to you, not what everyone is assuming that you should want to do or you know how you feel like you should go about this path to parenthood, but what matters most? Does it matter, first of all, being a parent, does it matter if you're biologically related to your offspring? Does it, ma does it matter if you're pregnant? Things like how many children do you want and, you know, how, how healthy are you and some of these other questions may not be as immediate. And, you know, the answers to some of these can change over time, absolutely. But the most important thing, I think, is to take a step back and reflect on what is important to you, not to anyone else around you. And, when we can do that, the process looks a lot different. Alice and I talked a lot about the number of times that we're sort of set up to grieve during this process, right? You find out that your fertility is impacted and you grieve the loss of that, of that choice. And you find out maybe that you might not be able to be a biological parent to your child and you grieve that loss. And then you try a procedure and it doesn't work and you grieve that loss. But hopefully if you feel more in control of the path that you're going down and you feel more empowered about the information that you have and the decisions that you're making, then you can grieve your loss. It's so important to do that, and then you can move forward from there. And that for me was a real turning point. I'll tell you a quick story where as I was trying to figure out how I wanted to go about this, one of the complicating things for me was that the Ewing sarcoma was in my leg. And so the idea of significant weight gain was going to just put a lot of stress on my legs specifically. And my orthopedic surgeon, who is one of the most wonderful people on the planet, looked at me totally straight-faced and said, yeah, if you want to try and get pregnant, go for it, but I'll probably put you on bed rest for the whole time. And it was such an amount of stress on my body. My mom was a ball of stress. My husband was a ball of stress. And at that point, I knew I had gone through some testing, and I knew that I was not going to be biologically related to my children. And so we were looking at the possibility of donor eggs, and I was considering carry, trying to carry a pregnancy with donor eggs and going through that whole process, and I was also considering adoption. And at that time, I had a friend who's also a cancer survivor who was pregnant with twins. So I jumped right to the assumption that she must have been pregnant with twins through IVF, and I called her up, and I was like, okay, how did you come to that decision? How does that whole thing work? What did that process look like? I just fired off a whole bunch of questions, and she said, hang on, slow down. Twins don't even run in my family, and it was a fluke that I even got pregnant. And so her story was totally different than what I was assuming, but she was the one who said to me, listen, you know, take this step back. Pregnancy, family building, all of this is such an industry in itself that you're being messaged by everybody around you, all these companies that are trying to sell you cute maternity clothes and all these bookstores that are trying to sell you self-help books and all of this other stuff. 
put your fingers in your ears and figure out what matters to you. And the way my husband and I came to the decision to adapt was that for me personally, and you know, I was very lucky. My husband really did not care where a baby came from, where somebody handed him that baby, if it was a hospital or an airport or a foreign country. He just wanted to be a dad. And so he knew that the majority of the stress was likely going to be on my body. And he said, listen, I will support whatever decision you make. And it's your call. And what I finally realized after a whole lot of soul searching was that it wasn't so important to me to carry a pregnancy that I was willing to risk all of the stress to my body and all of the stress to the people around me. Um, I wasn't going to have a biological link to my kid no matter how it was going to play out. And so that was the decision that we made. But when we look back on that process, it was so important to self-reflect and it was so important to get all of the information in front of us about what all of these processes would look like and pick the best match to our situation at that time. Um, And so that's really, I think, one of the key pieces to all of this is taking that time that you need with, you know, either your partner or your parent or, you know, close friends, whoever's opinion you trust, whoever is your sounding board, um, and really think about how you can go through this process or processes um, in in the way that's best for you. You know, yeah, it's so it's so funny to think about who I talked to when I was considering what I was doing. I mean, I it, it was so absolute that I was going to pick a sperm donor and free some embryos, and never in a million years at 31 years old was that on my radar. And it wasn't on my radar then that I would ever choose to be a single mom either. I didn't know any single moms by choice. Even that term is still pretty new in society's vernacular. And it was the most empowering thing I could do. Now, I was fortunate when I did my fertility preservation, Sam, that I was able to freeze half of my eggs fertilized and leave some of the eggs unfertilized. Back then, there was only a 2 to 3% success rate with, with uh, egg freezing because they weren't rich, rich fried eggs. They were slow frozen. And I just didn't want to take that gamble. But the interesting thing throughout the years is that I had this emotional attachment to my embryos because they put me one step closer to being a parent. And then I used, I very much used the vision of me being a mom as the thing to pull me through all the dark times. So there was something, I don't know if that's the same for everybody else who has frozen embryos as opposed to frozen eggs. I mean, they're both gametes. It's just, you know, one felt and, and is biologically, scientifically, one step closer to, be, to you know, becoming offspring, becoming a live baby. But... I I had so little time to think through all that when it was happening. I just feel really lucky that I ended up with enough eggs to do half and half and that once I was able to think through thoughtfully all these things that you're that you know we just talked about that they that everyone should consider, you know, then I started listening to listening to other people too much and I I once I went inward it was like no, this is really the right path for me. I'm ready. I'm ready emotionally to focus on the life of my child and, and, you know, and and when he was born, I don't know if this happened to you too when, when you had your children, that when he was born, it was such a distinct separation from cancer struggle to new life. It was like a very dividing line. And I was transformed. I felt like going through the cancer journey was transformational in and of itself in a lot of really good ways, being more comfortable in my skin, standing up for myself more, learning to say no, taking better care of my overall wellness, having some more balance in my life, not being a workaholic. But then suddenly I have this child and it's all about being present and it's all about life and it's very life affirming. And I grieve with those who who close that door, potentially not because they want to. You know, I grieve right there with them because I am in this place where I I have exactly what I always dreamed of and not everybody does um, does have that opportunity. And um, so I, I, I remember this funny conversation. I'm sitting with, with my dad at dinner and my family, and I said, yeah, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to use my embryo soon. And he looked at me and goes, don't you need a husband for that? And I said, well, the, no, that's what I've got the sperm donor for. 
you know, <laughs> it was such a funny, a funny comment, but it did get under my skin for like a good year where I delayed my plan because I thought, gosh, maybe I should still go find a husband. <laughs> like that's so easy, you know? And, uh, but I, I, you know, I think societally we, we have a lot of external pressure still, and there's a lot of shame around egg donors, around sperm donors, around single moms by choice. So let's get right down to some of those choices and try to break down some of that shame for everyone because, you know, we, we just, we believe that, um, that everyone should have choice and we live in the great country of good old USA and we're supposed to be free to make these choices for ourselves. And, um, we, we broke it down for you on this slide of, of what some of these paths look like. We, um, you know, adoption, domestic and international are both options. This column uh, applies to domestic. So what this slide is, is we wanted to just break down for everyone. You might want to take a picture of this on your phone. You know, the average time to conceive, the average time to take home baby, what the avenues look like, the various various vehicles that you need to know exist for that potential path, what the delays might be. There are lots of delays because some, sometimes people get into a really big hurry, like I'm just, I'm ready now, I'm ready now. And and uh, it, it isn't going to happen, you know, exactly 40 weeks from right now. Uh, and then what the average costs look like, because we know that that's such a huge consideration when so many of us are left financially devastated from having gone through cancer. Everyone's, of course, big question mark is, well, how much is it going to cost? So on the adoption side, do you want to handle this one, Sam? Sure. And I'll tell you also, the reason I um, focus on domestic was just because, and I'll when we get to more specific adoption information, I'll share more. But um, the international landscape is very, it's very kind of crazy. Um, it's very unpredictable. And at the time when we were going through our process and figuring out where and, you know, how and all of that, um, a lot of countries were changing their laws. And truth be told, I am not an expert. I'm not an expert on adoption in any form. I'm only really an expert in my own adoption story. But internationally, especially what I know now is that wait times are, are hugely long. There's still countries that won't let cancer survivors or survivors of any number of other things, by the way, adopt. Um, and wait times in a lot of countries, if somebody wants to adopt an infant, um, are very long. And so I have some resources that I can share for people that want more information, but I just wanted to sort of clarify why I focused on domestic. Um, and I can go through this one pretty quickly. Average time varies. Um, it's the same reason why the delays block is blank, because there are there's so much variability in the amount of time it takes from when you find an ad adoption agency or a facilitator till the time you bring home a baby. And it depends on, you know, the birth family's preferences and it depends on your preferences and it depends on who is facilitating the match. And there are just so many things that put that time frame out of your control. Um, so I just left it blank <laughs> because there was no you know, information I, yeah. I could come up with that would be helpful. I that's um, so fair. I mean, I have a friend ahead, who did a foster to adopt of uh, an older, her older daughter, and it was two years for the adoption to be finalized, you know, but she, mm -hmm. she had her daughter with her, and she adopted a 12-year-old. So when we talk yep. about options for I mean, everyone, some people, common. you know, pursue, yeah, yeah pursue an, adopting an older child, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we'll talk more about those different adoption options, and, you know, we also have heard many times from people who sign on with an adoption agency, go through their home study and get a call that their baby was born yesterday. So, okay. <laughs> you know, there's so much variability. Um, you know, I think one of the key things to point out from this slide, and I, I love how you put it earlier, Alice, about all of us sort of being at risk for a complicated path. These paths are complicated and also a lot of times really expensive. And this is the part that we see at the SAM fund the most. The cost of cancer, specifically the cost of family building after cancer, can be exorbitant. Um, and so on the adoption front, there are the opportunities to adopt through the foster care system that are of no cost. If you're adopting from another state, then in addition to all of the legal fees and the court fees and the agency fees and everything like that, you also potentially need last-minute travel, a week or two weeks in a hotel, all of the associated costs of traveling, meals, and all of that other stuff. So it can easily be upwards of $40,000 for a private domestic adoption. So again, a lot of variability, but unfortunately really, really expensive. I'm going to jump down to the last column because timed intercourse is still a possibility for folks. And when we were prepping for this, Sam said, do we really need to talk about that? And I said, ironically, yes, because, you know, people are often told that they're infertile when they're not. 
and they're told that they're never going to have a child, you know, get pregnant when, when they do. So I can't tell you how many stories I have of, of survivors that I was working with that were even considering egg donation. And I said, you know, just keep tracking your ovulation. And I, I in a second, I have a, a slide on the things that I want everyone to do in, in their survivorship when, um, when it comes to knowing your body. And I have, a, have two stories in the same year where women were told that they were infertile to the point that they needed to go the egg donor route. They were, they were looking for their egg donor, you know, finding a match, and they both got pregnant. They had a random month where they ovulated, and they both had a healthy babies. And, and also ironic, they both had ended up with girls. Well, so th- these things are really important on timed intercourse. It, it can happen. You know, some of the delays is missing ovulation because your window is small. Um, you know, most healthy couples that are under the age of 35 can can conceive within six months. That's that's what, you know, we see statistically. The avenues, of course, are a sperm and an egg. So if timed intercourse is um, timed procreation is really what it should be called, Prime, timed procreation, you know, a lot of same-sex couples can try an at-home insemination before even getting to a physician if they, um, you know, if they do have some fertility that, that's there. It costs nothing. You know, this is the thing that so many survivors are often surprised because we've done such a great job raising awareness about the impact of cancer treatment on fertility that survivors often think, okay, well, I don't even have to practice safe sex. I had a 23-year-old that I was telling Sam and Monica about a gentleman who was in one of my my seminars, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, I was 16, and I was told I was going to be sterile. And I said, but did you ever do a sperm analysis? And he said, no. And I said, do you, I mean, these are questions I have to ask, you know, young men when, when I'm in front of them, do you have ejaculate? And he said, yes, I do. I said, I highly recommend that you stop having unsafe sex <laughs> and that you, <laughs> you, you know, beeline to get a semen analysis done because, you know, your, your, your oncologist was without doing a semen analysis before and after your treatment, you know, six to 12 months after treatment again, uh, you know, when he, he did not undergo uh, a, a stem cell transplant, a bone marrow transplant. He didn't undergo the treatment that would that would warrant a lifetime of, of guaranteed sterility. You know, so these types of things are really important considerations to pr- still practice. Um, you know, same st- 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 <laughs> safe sex. Hello. <laughs> now, on the assisted reproduction front, so there's a few different things for people to know and consider. Depending on the number of gametes, if you do have gamete fro- gametes frozen, and depending, of course, upon finances, will help you decide which option you would want to pursue when it comes to assisted reproductive technology. So there are two terms that you may or may not have ever heard of, ICI and IUI. So ICI is where they transfer sperm, fresh sperm, directly into your cervix to give it a chance to swim, to fertilize your egg, and to then have uh, uh, an embryo implant into your uterus. And IUI is where your, the sperm is injected directly into your uterus, all timed with ovulation. Now, the average time to conceive on both of these is about eight months. So that means multiple attempts at ICI and IUI before a pregnancy occurs. ICI can be done at home. And IUI, considering you have to have a catheter to go much higher to reach your uterus, has to be done at an OBGYN's office or an infertility specialist like an IVF doctor. And, you know, the delays, you need to time it with ovulation. You know, um, you have to get time it with ovulation, get into the office. You know, you have to work around, you know, kind of work constraints. I mean, these are these are things that because we have a shortened window of fertility, people do have to consider. Now, ICIs are much more affordable. They're $200 to $350 per attempt. So some people do like to try that first if they have, A, a suitable level of fertility, or B, they have unlimited sperm source. So what I mean by that, some male survivors who have frozen sperm, well, they, they might not have 15 vials of sperm to make an attempt with ICI. They might have one vial of sperm, and they might need to go right to IVF. IUIs are more expensive. They're about $1,000 per IUI. And a lot of, uh, in some insurance companies who do cover fertility treatment, mandate six IUIs before even moving on to IVF. Now, in the case of a cancer survivor, that's not always a wise choice because of that shortened window of fertility. Uh, 
it, you often can age, basically age out of your fertility status before you're even done with your six IUI. And that's an insurance mandate issue that I'm trying to fix. Let's move on to IVF. IVF can be done with your own gametes. A gamete is an egg, a sperm, embryos, or it can be done with donor gametes. Average time to conceive is one to three cycles. So that's tough. Your body's already been through a lot. You you inject yourself with medications in your abdomen, um, oftentimes before your transfer also into your, into your tush. And it's a two-week process. Most of you probably are familiar with a two-week egg retrieval process just, you know, from learning about egg freezing. And then you do your transfer where you're under light, um, you're not under sedation for your transfer. Usually your physician has you take a Valium or two, and so you're nice and relaxed, and they transfer embryos directly, usually blastocysts. Um, that's just a, um, a level of development from the embryo directly into your uterus for implantation. And it does take average, even with you know, folks who have not gone through cancer treatment, one to three cycles for, uh, for pregnancy. It has to be with an infertility specialist, an IVF doctor, and that's often expensive, $20,000. Some of the delays that are important to note, if you have a genetic cancer, like a BRCA gene, those women like to do, often do PGD, which is genetic testing of their embryo, to choose an embryo that does not carry that gene. Those require special probes, and often those special probes take many months to create. PGS, which is genetic screening just to rule out chromosomal abnormalities like trisomy, like um, an extra sex chromosome, those things, that is very quick. That can often be a, um, a one-day turnaround. So you can test a day five embryo and then do a day six transfer, which is what I did with my embryos. And then that way, you vastly reduce the possibility of a miscarriage. In other words, a miscarriage won't occur from a chromosomally abnormal embryo. If a miscarriage occurs, there's a different source for the miscarriage. Now, IVF is also mandatory, of course. Well, not mandatory. It's, it's IVF with surrogacy. I should say it's not mandatory because you could um, have a surrogate who is also your egg donor. It's a lot rarer these days to have that possibility, but um, it certainly is an option in some states. IVF with surrogacy, once chosen, it's similar to IVF. It's a healthy surrogate. They have proof of pregnancy in the, bat in the past. Then, you know, hopefully one cycle and it will work. You know, that selection, of course, also depends on, on how many embryos are available. Must be with an infertility specialist. The delays can be significant in the sense that you have to have a health screening of the surrogate. You have to do your IVF retrieval. You know, the, the surrogate might not be in the same state as you. So th it is not a very fast path to parenthood, but it is often the right path for those who want to have a biological child but no longer have a uterus, had radiation to their uterus, or, you know, there are other reasons why it is not, um, it is not a good idea to, um, to carry their own child. Or their own um, their own offspring. The average cost is a lot. It's about a hundred thousand dollars. So those are the that's the overview of of these complicated options. But I'm going to give it back to Sam to talk about where do we start with that. Okay, where to start? So this slide I'm actually going to not spend a ton of time on, only because a lot of these I think we've already touched on. But Allison, I felt like it was very important for anyone listening to this webinar to feel like when you're done, when you've had time to process all of this, you have some sense of what, what happens next. Where do you go next? So I will reiterate our earlier point that self-reflection is key. Um, otherwise, you're sort of following what everyone else is telling you to do. So that's the most important first step that you can take. After that, educate yourself. Ask as many questions as you can. Ask the people that you trust. First of all, find out from your treating oncologist or your medical team if your fertility has been impacted, um, no matter what stage of treatment or survivorship you're in. Find out what your status is, and you'll be able to see what the options might be um, for you to consider. And then start figuring out, you know, if you want to learn about the different processes that Alice talked about, find specialists, find those infertility specialists in your community that, or, you know, or through your hospital maybe, 
where you can just learn. Figure out what the options look like. Figure out what your likelihood of success might be. Ask about the cost. Please, please, please ask about the cost up front because the worst thing and what we see at the SAM Fund a lot is that a lot of people go into this having no sense of how high the costs are going to be and then get totally blindsided at the end and open up a bunch of credit cards and max them out. And, you know, <laughs> heads up. Babies, no matter where they come from, are really, really expensive. And so starting with damaged credit and no savings and no money in the bank is just going to make it harder down the line. So think about all those things up front. Um, and the same goes for adoption agencies. If you're thinking internationally, which countries are open to cancer survivors adopting? Word to the wise, don't spend your time arguing against those that don't want you to adopt from there because you're not going to be able to take on the whole country of China. You're just not. So figure out yeah. what the options are, if any of them, you know, are appealing to you as a prospective parent, figure out what the domestic options are. And again, think about what your time frame looks like, how much time you're willing to wait, or how soon you want to get started. And again, ask about the cost up front. And I think most importantly, no matter which of these processes you choose to, per to pursue first or later, find the people whose opinions you trust, who have gone through this, who understand it, friends, colleagues, family members, whoever, um, and rely on them. Learn from their experiences. You don't need to follow their path, but probably they've done a whole lot of research that you're about to do so they could save you some time. They could you know, tell you what didn't work. They could tell you what sites not to go to. They can probably provide a whole lot of insight um, that, will, that will be helpful to you. And on that, you know, in the knowing your fertility status is the number one thing that I say to everyone because you want to be that empowered patient. So there's a few things you want to get a semen analysis done with uh, you, with your partner, or if you're um, the male in this equation, you want to get a semen analysis done. It's going to measure if your swimmers are swimming in the right direction, if they have two heads, two tails, uh, how they behave. And all those things are important to tell whether or not, um, you know, you're fertile, subfertile, or sterile. Blood work is important. Hormones, hormones, hormones. We need to know FSH count. We need to know AMH. We need to know what your estrogen levels are. Antral follicle count, AFC. Antral follicle count shows, it tells us how many follicles potentially in your ovaries currently uh, could house eggs. We want those follicles to be growing throughout a cycle, throughout an egg retrieval, and so that when we go in to retrieve eggs, we, we have a, a, a viable number of healthy, mature eggs to fertilize and work with. Ovulation kits are great. You know, they're so cheap. You pee on a stick every day. But this way, you know whether you're ovulating or not. I will forewarn you. If you're not and you don't get the smiley face on the, the, the type of stick that gives a smiley face, it makes you sad and go into it knowing that you might feel sad because you didn't get the smiley face that month. doesn't mean you're not going to ovulate every single month because if you did your testing and it shows that, yes, you still are fertile to some degree, then reduce your stress, keep, keep tracking your ovulation, and, you know, give it a go. I do have those two stories you know, of women who thought they weren't even, they had no eggs left, and yet they had these random months of ovulation, had timed intercourse, and, you know, boom, they had they um, they have babies. You know, so those, that's a really easy thing to do at home in the ovulation kits. Consultations, start meeting with specialists. So, you know, meet with an infertility doctor or two, you know, get second opinions, meet with agencies, take consultations with agencies, adoption agencies, surrogacy agencies, if that's a potential egg donor agency, um, the sperm bank, if you're considering using a sperm donor. Or if you're a male and you want to use a sperm donor, start talking to people about how they find a good DNA match for them. Um, potentially do genetic testing. This is something I forgot to include on here. But, you know, do 23andMe, do Recombine. You know, these are really good avenues to learn more about yourself and know kind of what, what would be, um, what would produce a, a healthy child. Psychosocial, just to reiterate the support. Seek support, professionals, Facebook peers. We have so many great Facebook groups. I just started one two days ago in advance of this, um, this conversation so that we can have an online place for people to come for extra support. And then, of course, survivor events. Okay, so in yeah. the last two minutes, we're going to talk about the road to adoption and also leave you with a whole bunch of resources. So <laughs> we've been doing a good job of talking slowly up until this point, I think, but I'll uh, give you <laughs> as much information as we can uh, in as short a window as possible. So, again, 
I'm not an expert in adoption. I'm not an adoption professional. I don't work in the space. Um, but what I do know as an adoptive parent is that I've been asked a lot of the same questions often enough that I think it's worth addressing here. So best case here, I'm giving you things to think about and ways to find the answers to questions after this. Um, and my contact information will be at the end. If I can help point you in any direction, I will. But this is very intentionally a broad strokes sort of road to adoption in brief. So I had to, of course, start with this first um, point that Alice made earlier because she knows how strongly I feel about it. It needs to be considered a legitimate option rather than a worst-case scenario. At the same time, I absolutely acknowledge that it's not for everyone. It doesn't need to be for everyone, and that's fine. Um, but it does need to be put out as an option in its own right. If you're considering it or want to learn about it, think about domestic versus international. There are so many differences, not the least of which have to do with the race or the ethnicity of a child, um, but also the distance that you might need to travel, the length of time you might need to wait, what the protections are in different areas, and so on and so forth, which brings me to the next point, which is that in the U.S. alone, everything is state mandated. There's nothing federal about it, which makes it very, very tricky. Um, but the best place to start is the state where you live. So find out if your state requires prospective parents to work with agencies. Um, Massachusetts is an agency state, and so you can work with an agency either for the full service, meaning from the time you walk into the door until the time you bring a baby home and finalize the adoption in court, you're working with that agency and their staff. Sometimes you can also work with a facilitator, in which case you do the home study with the agency, which is the opening sort of getting to know you part of the process, and the post-placement after you're matched with the baby and the court finalization. But you work with a facilitator. These facilitators can be attorneys, hospitals, any sort of third-party um, people that are involved. So find out what's required in your state. There are also some other variables that make this complicated ethically and logistically in other ways, um, having to do with licensing and, you know, again, what's required by the state and who's sort of working around those regulations. So just do your research um, and be sure that you're going about this in the way that you're comfortable. Again, understanding the spectrum you know, of options within adoption, fostering to adopt, private adoption, infant adoption, older child adoption, special needs adoption. There's so many labels that we can put on this, um, but adoption is definitely not sort of a blanket term for everything. There are a lot of options that you can make within the adoption conversation. The next one, open, semi-open, and closed adoption, really has to do with the level of closeness that you have with the birth family. So in our situation, our birth family is here in the same state. We have a semi-open relationship, which means that once a year I send a letter and photos to our adoption agency, who then forwards it to the birth family. So I don't have direct contact with our birth family, but we do have a link should we need it. If I've had medical questions or there's some piece of information, we have some way of getting to the birth family. Um, conversely, the birth family is not going to come knocking on my door because they don't necessarily know where I live. So some of this um, is for you to decide sort of what you're comfortable with, and some of it is left to the agency, but make sure you have those conversations so that you understand it up front. And then finally, the adoption tax credit. I have a resource on the next slide, which I'll share, where you can learn all about it. But basically, um, several years ago, it used to actually be an ad a tax refund. Now it's a permanent credit, but it offsets the cost based on certain um, income parameters, but it's, it's pretty widespread. It can offset the cost by up to a third. Um, the maximum tax credit is just shy of $14,000. So, again, I'm not an adoption professional. I'm also not a tax professional, but what I do know <laughs> is that it can be used as a credit on your tax returns for up to five years from when you adopt. So it really can help um, pretty significantly uh, mitigate that cost. So finally, we just wanted to end, and with our eye on the time here, we want to leave a couple minutes for questions if there are any. We wanted to leave you guys with resources and next steps in terms of websites that we trust and groups that we wanted to share. So you'll see both of our organizations are on there, Fertile Action and the SAM Fund. Um, I can say that on the SAM Fund website, we also have a list of resources. SAM Fund is focused very heavily on um, financial uh, challenges and 
and resources. And so on our resource list, there's one specifically for family building expenses and organizations that will help with any number of these um, processes and the associated costs. So check those out. You'll also see a few. Some are educational. Um, you know, a lot of them will refer you to other sites, but they're sites that we have vetted and that we trust. So do you want to talk about any of those, Alice? I just want to invite everyone to join the Parenthood After Cancer Treatment Facebook group that I just started. You know, this is just a better place to provide support and counsel and advice and resources to everyone. And I, I probably should have started it eight years ago, and I'm kind of slow to the uptake on Facebook sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I'm in so many other groups for assisted reproductive technologies to have a family, and I felt like we really needed one just for us, you know, survivors who are pursuing parenthood in any capacity uh, to talk. So I just want to really encourage you for that. I have two courses online that are free and easy to take at Udemy, udemy.com, male uh, hyphen uncle fertility, and then a female course as well. The male one takes about 27 minutes. The female one, I think the average time is 46 minutes. I encourage you to take those courses. They are free, very much geared towards um, medical professionals, but really relevant to survivors too. And we, we tell, I think, two inspiring, compelling stories in a documentary format on there. And that's kind of it. Oh, I guess kind of a last thing is I'm lobbying right now for the adoption tax credit to add a tax refund. So for low to moderate income families who have no tax liability, we want to make uh, put into permanence a refund. So if you are interested in supporting that, please reach out to me, Alice at FertileAction.org, and I'll let you know how to call your senator um, and your congressman to help lobby for that. So we do have a question. As an oncology healthcare provider, how can we start this conversation and appropriately guide our patients to resources where they can get more information? I love that question. Uh, thank you, first of all, for, for uh, the person who sent that, for caring, for joining the webinar today, and, and for wanting to be a part of the solution for, for the patients. The most important thing is actually to get them to re a referral to an uncle fertility specialist as fast as possible. So from my perspective, it's about asking, you know, uh, would you like the option to become a parent in the future? If the answer is yes, you know, then let's discuss the impact of your cancer treatment on your all your reproductive well-being because even those people who decide not to preserve their fertility still should hear from a specialist what that impact could look like so that they know what to look out for. If a woman has significant vaginal dryness, if a man... Um, if a male, you know, doesn't have any ejaculate, if he, uh, it, you know, there are, if he has test testicles that are shrinking, if he has, you know, um, uh, weakness or joint pain, you know, all those things that are the the unintended consequence of cancer treatment, it, it you know, that it's it's important to stress with these patients that they should have an alcohol fertility specialist, a reproductive person, a urologist. Um, you know, and, and a specialized um, OBGYN in this area to assess their their wellness, their reproductive wellness from start to finish. And if they do want to pursue all these various paths to parenthood, especially fertility preservation, if that is in their future, what um, what I've I have and, and and have a first webinar with Monica on is an avenue for insurance to cover the fertility preservation. So please check out on um, on Monica's website for triage cancer that webinar um, because it's just, it, the referral process just has to happen really quickly. See, there's another question. I'm really interested in getting online support, but not sure I want to put all my business on Facebook. Are there more private options for peer support? Sure, just reach out to me privately. Yeah, um, reach out to me on Alice at FertileAction.org. Happy to support. Um, privately, it is a private Facebook group, but um, you know I'm more than happy to support people privately still too. And if um, if if you have a specific you know area of need, I certainly would would try to connect you with somebody who's walked the same path. And I'm sure same with Sam. You know she and I combined because we've been doing our patient advocacy work for so long. We've we know a lot of survivors with various stories who are more than happy to provide peer support. You can also um, speaking of Johnny Immerman use um, um, Immerman Angels to find a peer, a peer supporter. We were going to even set up a formal program just on the fertility side with his angels. So Immerman Angels, if you don't know, is a great organization for peer-to-peer -peer support. 
and if you have a specific request for an angel who has walked a, a path to parenthood that feels similar to you, then they can help match you to someone. Other questions? Sam, did I miss anything? No, absolutely. You uh, you hit it all. And I just I want to echo, unless there are any last questions, um, the first thing that you said, which is thanking that first person who asked the question for caring and for being part of this conversation. Because I think so much of the challenge within the cancer community and so much of the frustration that so many cancer patients feel is that nobody's talking to them about this. And they don't always know the questions to ask. They don't even know they're supposed to ask questions. And so the first part of all of this, I think, really relies so heavily on making sure that people feel supported and that these conversations are taking place. No matter which direction they go, it's just so important. And I am very, very grateful to everyone who's participated today because you all come from, you know, different areas of the country and different walks of life. And, you know, probably some of you are cancer survivors, some of you are providers, some of you may even be caregivers or friends, but all of us are an equal part of this conversation, and I just am very grateful for the opportunity to see it go forward. Me too, and I want to echo too that with providers, I always I always wanted to impart that we as advocates don't expect any oncologist to be the expert in all of this. You know, we feel that they're doing such a great job in what they're supposed to be doing, which is taking care of us and getting us through the acute treatment. We want that. We want our providers to be rapid referral sources and supportive of of trying to make sure that there's enough time. In some cases, there's not. You know, to do front end uh, fertility preservation. You know, some folks are in unit and they're they're unable to pursue uh, a fertility preservation option. You know, due to a number of constraints. But I don't feel that they that you need to have a subspecialty in oncofertility, fertility. That you are a champion. It's actually enough you know, that you're creating a safe space for your patients to discuss this with you and, and, and what their concerns and considerations are. And if there's not an alcohol fertility specialist in their area, we can always get them on the phone with one. You know, even if they just connect with me or someone else that I've worked with in the past in my organization, that's going to be helpful so they feel like they, they are empowered and they have choices in front of them. And to all of you, I certainly just want to say thank you so much for joining us. We're really grateful, and we wish you all the best in your journey on your path to parenthood, wherever it takes you. <laughs>